Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Leslie presents. And now your host, Paul Leslie. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure we welcome composer David Shire. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me. Who is David Shire? Who is David Shire? At heart, Paul, just yes. uh, another hard-working Jewish film and theater composer <laughs> who's uh, trying to stay active as long as possible. What other areas would you like to find out who I am in? Well, I wanted to ask you, can you recall the first time you started to compose songs? When I was, a, I think, in my early early teens, my dad was a, a, a band leader and, and piano teacher in Buffalo, New York. And so music kind of came naturally to me. And I remember uh, sitting at the piano and writing down a piece called Sunday Thought. It wasn't exactly a song. It was like a little piano piece. And I think that's the early, earliest piece I remember writing down. <laughs> what composers have influenced you the most? I have a pretty wide range of of influences, both on the classical side and and the pop side. I suppose as I was growing up, certainly the great theater composers were my first loves, Gershwin and Porter and Rodgers and Harold Arland and uh, Frank Lesser and all those people, because that was the music that my dad taught. He taught pop music, which in those days, pop music was theater music, and theater music was pop music. So uh, that was kind of my benchmark. And then I branched out and discovered the classics, and Debussy, and Ravel, and Rachmaninoff, and the the more melodic and romantic classical composers. And then as I got older, I had my Stravinsky period and my other periods, and I had my Billy Joel period, and I had my Stevie Wonder period, and I had my Beatles period. And most recently, I've I've even had a fondness for Mahler, who in my younger days I thought was much too bloated and made no sense, and now I think he's incredible. So one's influences and tastes do change over time, and I think that's a good thing. How did you come to meet the lyricist Richard Maltby Jr., who went on to become your partner? We were at Yale together. We were freshmen there, and a mutual friend introduced us in the dining hall. And we found out that we had each come to Yale primarily to write musicals for the Yale Dramat and Drama School. And uh, he was looking for a composer, and I was looking for a, a lyricist. So uh, it was a match made in heaven, or made in New Haven. <laughs> What was your first impression of Richard Maltby Jr.? Well, I remember very specifically. I, you know, I was from Buffalo, and he was from Long Island, and I had gone to a private school, a day school in Buffalo, and he, but he had gone to Exeter Academy, and I thought he was a pompous theater snob, and he thought I was a hick from Buffalo. Although some aspects of those first impressions remain, we have been pals and and collaborators for I think what. 55 years now. I wanted to ask about the song Autumn, which you composed and went on to be recorded by the great Barbara Streisand. Can you remember the inspiration behind that song? Oh, very, very specifically. That was our first, that was our first big recorded song by a major artist. We wrote that for the first show we wrote at Yale. I remember being at Richard's Residential College and working on that number, for which I had written a couple previous melodies, and Richard kept throwing them away, saying they weren't good enough. So half out of anger and half out of inspiration, I wrote that melody, and I said, if you throw this one away, this collaboration is over. And he, he said, no, that's that's a keeper. And with a few adjustments, it became, uh, I think it was Barbara Streisand's third record it was on. Could you pick a favorite composition of yours? No more than I can pick my favorite son or favorite friend. There's a few that that stick out among among the shows. I think the best show Richard and I wrote are uh, it's two best are closer than ever and baby. I think the songs in those are are as good as we can do. And among film scores, the conversation and. Return to Oz I'm very fond of because it was, you know, the London Symphony and a big multi-themed picture, which I had been waiting to, to do. And I'm very 
pleased with that. But there's there's a number of others that I I have fondness for. It's hard to work on something so long and and not be somewhat fond of it. What about a specific artist's rendition of one of your songs? Was there a specific singer, recording artist, who you thought made a particularly good cover of one of your songs? Let me think. Let me think. Actually, we haven't had that many cover recordings of our our songs because they're not primarily pop songs. There's something I saw. Oh, well, there's been productions of some of our shows that we've really been very very proud of of secondary productions. We were invited to Brazil, to Rio last last year to see a production of Baby in Portuguese. And we went and kind of thought, well, it's a it's a free trip to Rio at least, and we didn't really think that it would be a knockout production. And it was. It was really great, even in Portuguese. <laughs> the actors were terrific. The songs came off beautifully. The drama of the show was really there. We were quite blown away by that. So that happens once in a while. You know, I haven't had that many radio hits, pop hits that have had a lot of cover records. The only one I've had is uh, really is With You and Born Again, which was done first by Billy Preston and Sarita. And that first recording is so good that it's, even though there are about 10 or 15 recordings out there, it's hard for something that someone to top that. I'm so grateful when it, somebody picks up one of our songs and does it that I tend to be very forgiving. I'm just happy that they did it. What do you want someone to get out of your songs? When someone uh, listens to it? Yes, whether they listen to it on a recording or a live performance. Just that it moves them. If it's a song meant to be moving, that they're moved by it. And if it's a funny song, that they find it funny. I guess I guess the benchmark is they, if they wanted to hear it again. <laughs> Music I like, I want to hear again. Music that I am indifferent to or dislike, I never want to hear again. So I guess that's the test almost of anything. I, it's a very simple one. Remember the first time I heard West Side Story, I thought, you know, this is unlike anything I've ever heard in the theater before. And I'm not sure if I, if I like all of it. But boy, is it interesting, and I can't wait to get the soundtrack album. And now, I don't think there's a, a less than spectacular note in it. So, You're a very busy man. I was hoping you could tell us about Take Flight. Well, Take Flight... Wait, let me just take a sip of something that I'm wetting my whistle with. Uh, nothing alcoholic, just... Well, Take Flight, I don't know how much you know about it, but it was a long saga. We worked on that show on and off for over a decade, and it's never really landed on Broadway where it was intended for, but we've had some wonderful experiences along the way. Uh, it was done in Russia, a concert version, while we were working on it. Uh, an earlier version was done in London at the Chocolate Factory. It was done in Japan uh, right after it was done in London, a, a huge production, much bigger than we ever intended for it. It was the fourth place. It was done in Australia at the uh, Adelaide Cabaret Festival. We did a, a, a condensed production there while we were trying it out. There's been really lovely experiences, as I said. The loveliest one would have been after its last production at the McCarter Theater at Princeton, if it had wound up on Broadway. But uh, the reviews there were ranged from good to indifferent. No one picked it up to, to bring in. We do kind of harbor a hope that uh, someday we'll have a chance to revisit it again, because we, we suspect that some of the first versions we had of the show were much better. They were freer, more kooky. But the show was workshopped intensely over and over again, and it changed radically from our first conception. It became much more intellectually sound, but now that we can step back from it and look at it with a little bit of objectivity, I think we would have been better off if someone with all its flaws, had produced it a year or two into our writing it, and then the soul of the show we wanted to write would have been on stage, and then we could have fixed fixed it up around that. But, you know, you get so much so much input at workshops, and uh, workshops can take, you know, can destroy your original impulse. And every change you make seems intellectually like a very good idea, like, oh, yes, that's why the show isn't. 
but then you, you get down the road and look back and you think, well, yeah, but fixing that thing killed something more valuable. As for projects I'm working on now, I, the main one is a, a musical I'm working on, not with Richard, but with the New Yorker writer and essayist Adam Gopnik, who wrote Paris to the Moon and other collections of essays and writes almost weekly for the New Yorker. found out that he had always wanted to write a musical, and I was delighted because usually writers of that caliber are, you know, in other fields of, of writing, either don't want to write a musical or actively dislike musicals as being mostly empty-headed. But he, on the other hand, claims he came to New York to write musicals. And we hooked up about three or four years ago. My wife made the, the meeting. We've been working on a show called Table, which is an original, ever since then. And we just did a big reading of it yesterday with a, a full group of actors at the uh, director at, at, at Adam's house. For the first time, I thought we really got something here and the show is going to get on. The director is Gordon Edelstein, who is the also the artistic director of Long Wharf Theater, which is a, I don't know if you know about it, it's in, near New Haven. And it's a very prestigious regional theater that uh, has been around a long time and produces new things as well as... Uh, uh, you know, repertory things. And Gordon's very was very taken with the show even a, a year and a half ago and wants to schedule it. We, our next thing is, a, God help us, a workshop production of three weeks in the fall at Long Wharf, but hopefully that will lead to a Long Wharf production. And then I'm trying to not think beyond that. If it, someone wants to move it to higher profile realms, that's fine. And if not, I'm not going to be disappointed by it because we've had so much fun writing it. Adam is a wonderful person, so knowledgeable about everything, and I've had more fun talking to him about great books and, you know, just cultural life in general. He used to be an art critic. That's been kind of the pleasure of the show. With all of your accomplishments, what is the best thing about being David Shire? That I'm married to Dee Dee Kahn who is the most wonderful wife that anyone could have. We just were heading toward our 29th wedding anniversary, and it's second marriages for both of us. He's just a wonderful person and a constant inspiration. I know that sounds a little corny, but it's absolutely true. I'm enjoying my work more these days than uh, I have, uh, I think, at almost any period in my life. We just moved to a uh, community five minutes away from our old one in a house that's a little smaller, but I have a wonderful studio in it. I think I'm working much more now for the pleasure of just its own sake, you know, working working for its own sake rather than thinking, oh, God, this has to be the greatest thing I ever wrote or where is this going to wind up? And it's it's a lot healthier. I'm very pleased with that kind of turn in my, my personality. It makes life a lot ple more pleasant and, and productive, actually. I've never been working on so many things at the same time. I've got a, another movie to score in the fall, and uh, Dee Dee and I are working on a animated children's musical series cartoon, which now somebody wants to make first as a feature and then as a television series. And I've been doing both music and lyrics for that. The show with Adam, by the way, I'm, I'm the composer and co-writing the lyrics with him. So I've been writing more and more lyrics lately. A number of little side projects, a song here, a bit of incidental music there. I just did a uh, incidental score for the play Travesty at the McCarter, and that was fun. That's all good things about being David Shire. <laughs> My last question is very open-ended. What would you like to say to all of our listeners? Well, I, what I'd like to say to them, and this is kind of self-serving, they can Google me, they can go to my website and see various things I've I've written, and if they haven't heard them, to get them and listen to them or get those movies and watch them, <laughs> because I'd like to expand my audience, too, and uh, that would be the nicest thing. Nothing wrong with that. For anyone who wants more information, you can visit the website davidshiremusic.com. Thank you so much for doing this interview. It's been a great pleasure. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much. I hope you got all the material you wanted. We did. Thank you. Great. Have a good one, Paul. Nice meeting you over the phone.